website, econclub.org. As we get started, though, I'd just ask you to silence your cell phone so we do not disturb the program today. And one of the many traditions of the EC meetings is we always begin by honoring our great country with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would just ask you to stand and join me. The flag is behind me. Thank you. Kindly remain standing as our invocation today will be delivered by Deacon Joseph Adams of the Hartford Memorial Baptist Church. Deacon. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we thank you for this day, a day like many other days, filled with the opportunity to help someone else. It's a quality that sometimes we forget. We want to take this moment to thank the executives, the corporate executives of Michigan, who recognize that we were having problems with the clear water in our public schools. They stepped forward, and the executives are providing leadership. They are taking the water system out and replacing it with a temporary water system that will provide clean and safe water for our students. It's these types of cooperation and tasks that gives Detroit an opportunity to move forward and become great again. I'd like to thank the school board for working with the executives and hopefully we can resolve our problems. With this, our students will be given the opportunity to and the education, which will give them a position in our society to protect this nation. We ask these blessings from you who have created us all. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Adams. You can all please be seated. And uh, perfect segue, Deacon Adams, we love having students with us. And as many of you know, we always bring high school and college students to every one of our meetings. We want them to understand what it's like uh, to make business decisions and be in the business world and understand how to network with people. So today, as no exception, we've got two groups of students with us. Uh, thanks to our generous corporate sponsors. I would like to welcome uh, some students from Cody DIT. Thank you to Mark Davidoff and the great firm Deloitte. And also students from Martin Luther King Jr. High School. Thank you, Mary Beth Howe and Wells Fargo Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for our students and their terrific sponsors. Two quick things on your table, if you don't mind. Uh, one is our sponsor brochure. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for these terrific sponsors and their generosity. I would ask you to take a look at the logos here. Patronize these companies if you can. If you are a sponsored member of one of these great companies, we thank you. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor, I'd love to help you with that as well. And we can talk uh, offline. Just call my office. Also on your table, we continue to add programs like today's. Uh, we hope you can be with us next Tuesday if you're interested in the effects of artificial intelligence on all of our jobs. The president of Lee Hack Harrison will be addressing us uh, at the Weston Book Cadillac next Tuesday. And then uh, we'll be adding much more. I know uh, if you're an automotive fan, uh, Jim Lentz, CEO uh, of Toyota, um, Toyota Motor North America is going to be with us and also many, many more others to come shortly. So check the website, look for your email, and we'll be adding more programs. Uh, we encourage you to tweet using at De Economic Club and follow or join the conversation using hashtag Econ Club. And from time to time, I love to highlight the incredible history of speakers at the Detroit Economic Club, and today is one of those times. Mr. Kudlow, sir, October 18th is a very popular date in DEC's 84 history. In fact, 18 other speakers 
have been at our podium on this day in history. Let me share a few highlights. In 1943, a member of British Parliament, J.J. Llewellyn, spoke to the group. His title of his speech, think about the date, 1943, Combined Plan, Combined Victory. In 1954, Arthur Burns, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and later became Federal Reserve Chairman, and I know, Mr. Codlow, you know Arthur Burns. 1972, we were lucky enough to host presidential candidate and U.S. Senator George McGovern. 1982, locally, a gubern gubernatorial debate between Jim Blanchard and Richard Headley. 1993, J.W. Marriott, and again in the world of debates, Senator Stabenow and Sheriff Mike Bouchard debated at the Detroit Economic Club in 2006. And today, Mr. Kudlow, we're pleased to add you as our 19th speaker on this day in history. So congratulations, and thank you very much. And finally, one of the more popular elements of DEC meetings is the Q&A session. We want to hear from you. Mr. Kudlow is going to take your toughest questions. There are instructions on your table how to submit those questions via your smartphone. And those questions will make their way to our presiding officer, who I'm about to put to work. Mark Davidoff is the Michigan Managing Partner for Deloitte. He is a DEC board member, a generous friend to the DEC, to myself personally, and a supporter of many, many things in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, I turn this over to, and please welcome, Mark Davidoff. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce today's amazing speaker. Larry Kudlow serves as the Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Director of the National Economic Council, coordinating the President's domestic and global economic policy agenda. Prior to his current role, Mr. Kudlow served as a senior contributor for CNBC and host of CNBC's primetime show, The Kudlow Report. Mr. Kudlow also served as Chief Economist and Senior Managing Director for Bear Stearns & Company. During President Reagan's first term, Mr. Cutler was Associate Director for Economics and Planning at the OMB, where he was engaged in the development of the administration's economic and budget policy. Mr. Cutler started his career at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and served as a senior editor and columnist for the National Review. Mr. Cutler also authored JFK and the Reagan Revolution, A Secret History of American Prosperity and American Abundance, The New Economic and Moral Prosperity. Mr. Cutler was educated at the University of Rochester and Princeton's University, Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and is actively involved in numerous boards and organizations in New York City. Please join me in a, in a warm Detroit Economic Club welcome for Larry Cudlow. Uh, thanks very much. Gracious introduction. Um, I guess so. On this is a special date, huh? October 18th. And I'm going to take Arthur Burns. I'm going to take Arthur Burns. He was he befriended me when I was a Cub Scout working for Reagan. Arthur was our ambassador to Germany after we ran the Fed all those years, and he kind of helped tutor me. And um, he's a pretty smart guy. What year was it that he, he spoke? 54, so he was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under uh, Eisenhower. But I'm going to give, this will surprise many of you, uh, I'm going to give a close second, I know you're dying to get my comments on all these speakers, but I'm going to give a close second to George McGovern. Whoa! Yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> please don't throw any tomatoes. So. I'm going to give him a close second because after his political career, he became an innkeeper in New England. And on my show, he declared his first support for capitalism and free markets. He turned completely, and he came back as a commentator several times. So Burns taught us, McGovern learned. Last time I was here was 2016 in the summer, uh, August 8th or something. I was with um, then-candidate uh, Trump, who outlined his uh, 
economic growth plan, tax cuts, deregulation, energy, and so forth. It was a very detailed uh, speech. We flew out, and he did it well. It's funny, we're looking back at the speech. Um, basically, promises made, promises kept. I mean, really, it, you know, we didn't quite get a 15% corporate tax rate, although we fought hard for it. But we got 21%, it's pretty good, and maybe it's not over yet. And he talked about deregulation, he talked about energy. And what I want to say is, um, regarding his successful economic plan, I think the biggest story of the year for all Americans is an economic boom that virtually everyone, and most particularly our critics, said it would be impossible to achieve, okay? And it's a boom. I'm going to talk about that more in a few minutes. But it's a very growthy economy. It's offering opportunities across the board. It's doing exactly the opposite of what our critics suggested. And I will say this, it's my judgment, I could be wrong, I believe this economic boom is going to go on for a bunch more years. You know, really, we, ha we had a rise in the economy after the terrible financial crash, but it was only 2% a year, should have been 8 or 9% a year. Uh, when I was growing up in the economics world, people said, if you're 2% or less, it's a growth recession. A growth recession. And I believe that's what we're in. Now, I believe we are entering into a solid economic recovery backed by business investment and capital formation and risk-taking and confidence, things we have not seen in many years. So some headlines, some bullets, okay? Uh, yesterday, the day before, the Davos people, economic forum people, said the United States uh, economy is now the number one competitive economy in the world. It's the first time we've had that position since um, 2008, the Davos group. Second, recent bullet, there are more job openings, about 7.1 million, than there are people unemployed. That's a remarkable stat. And I want to put a pitch in, I want to get all the unemployed back to work, and we're trying to do our share for policy. My colleague and friend Ivanka Trump is running a program with many, many companies to go through what she calls a reskilling of many of the people who are out of work. It's a great word, but it's a great cause. She's enlisted so many corporations. It's exactly what we need to fill those jobs, to fill those jobs. Um, the NFIB Small Business Survey and the Conference Board Survey continue to show that consumer and small business confidence continues to rise at historic levels. I, I want to pause there for a minute. I think these confidence surveys are very important. They're the best poll of how people look at the economy. Um, virtually the day after the November election two years ago, you can look at the charts, the NFIB Small Business Confidence and the Consumer Conference Board Consumer Sentiment started to rise from an extremely low level and continued to rise throughout 2017 and continued to rise throughout 2018. Confidence. We haven't seen that in a very long time. Now, in terms of the boom itself, um, new information, industrial production, Business equipment, which is an indicator, a leading indicator of capital goods and business investment, is rising almost 9% rate. We haven't seen anything like that. And I, I, I want to pause there. When we developed the president's tax cut plan and his deregulatory plan, we argued that lowering business taxes, which had not been done for decades, lowering business taxes would generate 
the kind of business confidence and business investment, long-term investment, right, CapEx in the Wall Street jargon. But we're talking about plants and equipment, buildings, campuses, technology, as you know. That the trigger had to be a lowering of the corporate tax across the board, big companies, small companies, 100% expensive. We haven't built new equipment in a long time. We have basically have not increased our capital stock in 20 years. That is why productivity has fallen. That is why real wages have gone sideways. You can look at the data. So I know it's only a year or so into this, actually for the tax cut. Well, it's almost a year for the tax cut. But I'm suggesting that the idea that lower corporate tax rates for large and small companies will in fact, promote the kind of business investment we need to rebuild our economy. And let me also pause. It's not exactly breaking news. I am a Reagan supply sider. Um, the biggest beneficiary of a reduction in the corporate tax, stay with me on this, we argue, Kevin Hassett, Naira and the CA, myself, Art Laffer and others. We argue the biggest beneficiaries would be middle income folks, blue collar folks who haven't had a raise in almost 20 years. That's what the numbers show. It was a controversial academic argument years ago. Now many people have joined us in agreement. Lowering the business taxes sparks business investments, sparks productivity, sparks higher wages, fatter paychecks for the middle-income, blue-collar workers. And it looks like it's coming true. It's even coming true probably faster than we would have thought. So some more facts. Blue-collar workers, employment, is growing significantly faster than the rest of the country. Blue-collar workers, employment growing faster than the rest of the country. Another bullet. In terms of wages, which are rising, the biggest gains are coming from the middle and lower income, from the blue collars and the hard hats to the lower skilled service people. They are getting the fastest increase in wages, faster than white collar workers. I might add, these stories were first got my attention a few weeks ago on the front page above the fold of that well-known supply-side newspaper, The Washington Post. That was a joke. Um, it's what we hoped for, and it appears to be happening. It shows that this is a durable economic boom, and it is not clustered simply at the top. Now, mind you, I have no problem with wealthy people. You know, I want to always make the non-rich rich, as Jack Kemp used to say. But the middle and the lower middle have not done well for at least 20 years, maybe longer. And the numbers show they are gaining the most in this economic boom. Um, the Atlanta Fed and the St. Louis Fed think the third quarter GDP, which will come out next week, will be um, above 4%. We'd be happy with above 3 to be honest with you. Most people thought we'd never get above two. Uh, we'll see. We'll get to them soon. We had 4.2% GDP in Q2. We had 3.2% GDP in the first half. These are good numbers. We have broken through the 2% barrier. We have broken through the 1% to 2% barrier, which we were told secular stagnation would continue forever. No, it won't. No, it won't. We changed policies. We have confidence. Business investment, by the way, consumer spending nearly 5% year on year. President Trump not only lowered tax rates and deregulated and also um, resurrected the energy business, which is going to be an unbelievable story. We will be energy independent and dominant. We may already be, but at least the next year or two. He argued from day one, and this is why I think the confidence indexes rose so much when he was elected and continue to be high. He argued that the war against business is over. 
He argued that the war against success is over. He argued that the war against fossil fuels is over. He basically says, said, and continues to say, if you look at his rallies, you'll see the same things, we should reward success, not punish it. And that marks a change from prior administration. Reward success. Let people keep more of what they earn. Take away the red tape that was strangling small businesses, which are now flourishing once again. And open up the energy business. Those are confidence builders. Those are important themes. People heard it. President Trump, obviously a former successful foreign businessman himself, basically is saying to folks, just take a rip at the ball. Just take a rip at the ball. I'm behind you. And so I would add now, over a year into it, that American workforce, entrepreneurs, investors are absolutely crushing it. Crushing it. We are the strongest economy in the world. Trillions of dollars of capital are coming into the USA. We have a steady, strong dollar. We have virtually no inflation. We may be growing at 3 or 4% or better. Money is coming here from everywhere, from Europe, from Japan, from China, from Latin America. And it makes a big difference because you can invest in a plant or whatever, and you only pay 21% marginal tax rates. If you build a thing, you can write it off in a year. These are huge changes. And you have a president who believes in business and growth and prosperity, and who especially believes in the improvement of the middle class, the blue collars I talked about. This is just so important. It was a complete change. Have people seen it? I, I don't know. I think it's going to play a role in the election, but I'm not in that business of forecasting the elections. All I'm saying is, the change in policies and the change in attitudes have created an economic boom. That's the biggest story of the year. The number one story. I know there's a lot of stories out there. This is the biggest story of the year. A moment on trade. A moment on trade. The president is a trade reformer. And when he campaigned, and since then, he said he was going to initiate trade reforms. He is doing so. His basic belief, zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, and zero subsidies. That's his basic belief, free trade. But we don't have free trade. Now, we got a pretty good deal, I think, on the USMCA. I think it was a pretty good deal. We opened up markets for our farmers. We improved the domestic content for our manufacturers. We actually got better patent rights and intellectual property rights, financial services, digital services, pretty darn good deal. And therefore, this still remains a tariff-free area, and all the supply chains are still in place. Now, we've opened talks with Europe this past summer, and more recently, we've opened trade talks with Japan. And the three countries have signed a tripartite agreement unity, objecting to what they call non-market practices, and that we would work together to change non-market. Non-market practices is a euphemism for China. A word on China. You're, you're looking at a free trader. That's been my history. We've tried to negotiate with China. We went to Beijing, had them in Washington. Some went back to Beijing. Some came back to Washington. Unfortunately, China has not responded positively to any of our asks. They are unfair traders. They are illegal traders. They have stolen our intellectual property. America has the greatest technology in the world. It's the backbone of our economy. It's the innovation and the inventions and the applications that drive us. China can't seem to do that, so they steal it. We can't allow that. It's the 
forced transfer of technology from American companies in China because they won't let our companies own their companies. They do joint ventures, but they keep the ownership. When they keep the ownership, they can tell you, put your whole blueprint on the table. We want to look at it. There's an opportunity of theft. And if they give you better ownership, they won't give you a license to start the business. This is unfair. This is illegal. By the way, it breaks all the WTO rules. WTO needs to be reformed. I'm not going to dwell on that today. But they don't play by the rules. We have to change that. We have to defend America's interests, defend American workers, and farmers, and ranchers, and business people, and manufacturers, and the blue-collar people we're talking about. We have to defend them. That's the President's view. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Now, he has used tariffs as part of his negotiating strategy, and he won't let go of the argument and criticism that China must change in a way which benefits the United States. Past presidents in both parties have given lip service to the China problem. They never followed through. Mr. Trump is following through. We will see how this story goes. It looks like that President Xi and President Trump will meet for talks at the G20 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, in a few weeks, actually. We'll see if something good, I hope something good comes from it. But thus far, Chinese have not given any positive response to our asks, which I have just outlined for you today. And I will say this, we have the economic advantage right now. Part of the reason the yuan is falling is because people are disinvesting in China. They've lost confidence now. It's not a free market, but they're trying to get out. We are in a boom, and they know it. We are in a position to back up our actions. I'm not sure they can. We will see. We will see. Back to the U.S. I'll finish up. This boom, as I mentioned before, I'll just lay this out, is not a sugar high. These are supply side, lower tax rates and deregulation. This is not like pumping money in, in Keynesian style. People say that, they just don't get it. And as I said earlier, these incentives, we change the incentive structure, allow our economy and its productive capacity to grow on the supply side. It's actually counterinflationary, counterinflationary. And I notice, and I'll leave this as a general matter. The face of the, what I call the new Trump economy, threefold. Blue-collar workers, men and women who own and operate small businesses, which is proliferating, and finally, energy. It's all incredibly important, all revived by the new incentive plan a more limited government across the board. And so far it's working. I see no reason why it can't continue. I'll just end with this note. My former boss, Ronald Reagan, always said and ended speeches with a very simple line, in America, the best has yet to come. My new boss, showing us again that in America, the best is yet to come. I believe it. I hope you do too. Thank you very much. Now, I guess we're going to do some questions and answers if they're not too hard. Well, I can't promise. I'll sit down here. We'll try. Please. Well, thank you uh, for coming back to Detroit. Uh, we talked before about uh, your visit here during the campaign in August of 16. And uh, in that uh, really substantive policy speech, uh, the candidate, Trump, spoke about regulation, tax reform, trade, and energy. And you covered a lot of that in your, in your talk today. Can you give us a little bit of, of the backstory about that speech? Because um, I was there, and it was a very substantive speech, which I think was a pivot moment in the campaign. Can you, can you share a little of the sure. backstory? 
Um, it's an inter interesting question. So that was in August, and much of the campaign and much of the uh, candidates really showed no particular substantive plan and were criticized. Now, people were leveling the same criticism of candidate Trump, but we knew inside the campaign, I was an informal advisor, Steve Mnuchin, now the Treasury Secretary, was heavily involved. Steve Moore was heavily involved. Laffer was heavily involved. A lot of people. President Trump was heavily involved. People would say to me, Larry, why are you doing this? He doesn't mean it. He's just using you. I don't know what, but he's using you. And I would say, well, wait a minute. I just had a 45-minute meeting with him about tax credit and a 15% business tax rate and lowering personal tax rate, et cetera, et cetera. So, the speech in Detroit was the culmination of a bunch of months and a bunch of people with a lot of meetings to hammer out a growth agenda, a prosperity agenda. Taxes, regulations, energy, and you know, other areas as well, trade. And if you read the speech over, and get it online and so forth, you will see a lot of detail, which is what we want, a lot of detail to say to critics or media, wait a second, this is well thought out. We actually published fact sheets with this uh, showing the uh, estimates of numerical effects on the economy. You know, and that's not never perfect, but we had several people modeling on this. Uh, Kevin Hassett at AEI, the Tax Foundation, and so forth. So we just threw as much detail as we possibly could. And the speech was well received, and a lot of people who were doubters took a second look, which is, you know, what we wanted. The campaign was not only about the economy, but it was a big, big subject in the economy. Um, by the by, a month later, President or Candidate Trump spoke at the uh, Economics Club of New York, uh, like this one, a prestigious platform, with um, a kind of an extension of the Detroit speech. If you go, it's interesting, I've done this a couple of times. Steve Miller is a top speechwriter and colleague of mine. I've looked at, it's so consistent, from Detroit to New York and then to Washington. So that was the intention, that's what we did. And I don't know, made sense to me. So it does. So you, you spoke about it and you know, Detroit's a bit of a small town and many of us uh, see each other a lot and are involved in all kinds of conversations, but you don't see people high-fiving each other about the economy. Uh, in maybe, Detroit? Well, in Detroit or when we travel around the country and talk to others, I think people may be distracted with other things that are in the news or, or otherwise. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a high five in Detroit. Okay, well, now that, we, now that you and I have that done, how do we get the, how do we get the, the greater public to appreciate what is happening? Well, you know, I think they do. I really, that's why I, I paused a moment on the confidence numbers. I've, I've been in this game one way or another, Wall Street broadcaster in the government, now government. I've never seen such a, a rebound in confidence so quickly, and it is sustained now. It's just about two years. You'd expect it to, you know, a, Big rise and then at least flatten out. Mm -hmm. No, it's continuing to rise. I don't know if they do high fives here in Detroit besides you and me, but I believe those people are, you know, in these polls, which are taken routinely, they're very good and reliable. That's what they're saying. We have confidence. And we haven't seen that in prior administrations. And again, I'm, I want to be nonpartisan here, Democrats and Republicans. Not seen that kind of movement, so that's got to mean something. When you couple that with fatter paychecks uh, after tax, after inflation, disposable income, take-home pay, uh, no more red tape strangling small business. I mean, this is, you know, the, the the point that men and women owning and operating small business is a huge point because we haven't seen that in many years. Huge point. That's why I included is the, what I call the, you know, the Trump economy, the new face of the Trump economy. 
So, I don't know. I think people do. I think the media doesn't. But I'm not going to blame the media. The media reports, more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, the word is out. I mean, look, my point about the blue collar reemergence, okay, which, by the way, was exactly the same as we saw in the Reagan years. That was exactly the same uh, idea. Meaning, in effect, uh, to, to re quote John F. Kennedy and to re quote Jack Kemp and to re quote Larry Kudlow, a rising tide is lifting all boats. Just think about it. So I, I think they know. I mean, the, the, the biggest rise in blue collar employment and the biggest wage increases, not the highest wages, but the biggest wage increase is coming from blue collars and, and, and service workers. I mean, that's just something. We haven't seen that in a long time. So you mentioned uh, President Kennedy and President Reagan. Your, your book, uh, obviously, focused on them. Thank you. A little, a little way, if you can Amazon, Amazon. It, one click, just yeah. get it, no problem. Please, everybody right now, just no afterwards. A um, little compare and contrast. Uh, President Kennedy, President Reagan, President Trump. Wow. We have all day. Wow. Um, different people employing similar economic policies. That's the key. That was the thrust of the book with my co-author, Brian Dimitrovic. Really, different people. But each one inherited a poor economy. Uh, I could go into all kinds of stuff, but I, I don't want to go into too much. I'm just going to make that statement. Uh, each one pledged in the campaign when they ran to revive the economy, and each one chose a path of lowering marginal tax rates, providing incentives for work and saving, investment, business, risks. Each one employed that. And a more limited government. Each one had that philosophy, a more modest government. So I would argue that President Trump is absolutely in that tradition. And further, the point that I've been making for several years on the air, we just needed to fix our broken corporate tax system, the business tax system, for large and small companies. We, we had not attended to it in years. You know, we, we made terrific reforms in the 80s on personal tax rates. That was the Reagan contribution. Kennedy did it way back in the, in the early 60s. Um, we did it, too in a modest way, but ours was aimed at business tax cuts because we were, we were losing ground to a lot of countries. Moreover, our companies were leaving. We were not getting the business investment, hence productivity lag, so did real wages. So President Trump has, you know, took it to that spot, which is uh, new. Mm -hmm. And it had it'd been a pet hobby horse of mine for a whole long time, and I got, you know, finally got a chance to, to do something with it. So each one, you know, dealt with the cards that were handed to him. Each one was a growth president. I understand it's early for President Trump, and, you know, you may scoff at, at my optimism, but it looks pretty good to me right now, and it's following that, that path. So one stark difference between President Trump and President Kennedy and President Reagan and actually any other president is Twitter. Yes. So we can't go back and ask ourselves, what would President Kennedy have tweeted? Did or Kennedy tweet? I, I don't, don't, don't think so. Uh, how do you view how do you view the the Twitter asset? We talked about that a little bit it's before. It's a great communications tool. But how does the president? I mean, he uses it so artfully. Where does that? Somewhat artfully. Yes, he does. Right, so it permits him to go directly to the public. I mean, he's got. I don't know. How many million? 25, 30 million followers or something? 40 million. Thank you. You're, that's a big number. I did a lot of tweeting uh, when I was at CNBC, but worked hard at it, and I had 250,000. <laughs> now it's pretty good for the network. He's saying 40 million. So the president can go directly to the people. He can go over the heads of the media. It's a very important tool. And he's expressing his messaging. He's messaging. You may not agree or and so forth and so on, but he's messaging. Powerful. Very powerful. Very powerful. So I understand you flew in this morning. I assume you drove here from the airport. Um, you might have noticed our roads. 
So infrastructure for us is a huge deal. Uh, our governor, Governor Snyder, had a 21st century infrastructure commission to look at roads, bridges, water, sewage, uh, broadband, and, and energy, and uh, took a, uh, a look at the world, best practices, took a look at where we were, where we were in spending, even given our latest tax policy change and, and uh, the road bill. But we're still a couple billion dollars a short a year forever. Um, what, what, is, what is your view on where we might go with infrastructure policy nationally and how that might impact Michigan? Well, the first thing I have to say, with all honesty, is uh, in Washington, I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. It's not my normal working hours to get the plane to come to Detroit Economics Club. So I must confess I probably was nodding off a little bit in the car. You mean first, the roads didn't wake you? First point. It felt okay to me, but I'm, you know, I got you. Second point I'll make more seriously. I want to make three points here. The second point is I, I don't. I'm not uh, well schooled in the numbers, the fiscal numbers here, in the governor's plan. Uh, in general, my view with respect to state and local governments is that tax and regulatory matters are just as important as they are in the federal level. So, we were talking uh, earlier, Detroit's a kind of a funny situation. There's a city of Detroit, but the city has more land mass than probably any other city. Is that, is that right? Because I, I covered that mm -hmm. on the show every night, um, various parts of the bankruptcy stuff and so forth and so on. I'm not here to criticize, I'm just saying, fill up the land. You know, bring companies in here. Uh, this is not a new thought, but you bring companies in here, you know, don't make them pay capital gains tax for 25 years. Okay? You might not even want to pay income tax for 5 or 10 years. Make it up on the sales tax. Now, again, I do not know the fiscal structure. I'm just suggesting if it pays to work in Detroit, people will come and work in Detroit. Okay, that's just a generic view. My third view is more generally in infrastructure. Uh, we have lots to do with bridges, roads, and tunnels. I understand that. However, I want to support the energy boom. And this is a huge factor in our economy. Huge. And it was neglected by I don't know how many presidents with very poor uh, energy policies, in my view. Subsidies, and credits, stuff that doesn't work penalties for stuff that could work. And, of course, President Trump has spent a good deal of time changing those policies. What are we getting? We are the world's leader, by far, of natural gas production. I mean, by far. They've got so much natural gas coming out of the Permian Basin, they have to flare it. And we're going to send it to Europe, we're going to send it to Japan, we're going to send it to Asia. Oil production... We're through 11 million barrels a day. We're passing the Saudis. We're very close to the Russians. Um, Ryan Zinke, who runs the Interior Department, Rick Perry, who runs the Energy Department, and others think we'll be at 15 million barrels a day in a, two, two years. I believe their, 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 their deadline is 2020. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, the coal industry may be a more limited issue, but can do a lot. Clean coal, they're working on it. We're taking the handcuffs, the regulatory handcuffs. We'll see. It may be uh, exported. There's big, still big demand for coal around the world. The nuclear industry, we're trying to help revive that by taking the regulations down. The whole energy sector. whole energy sector. So coming back to uh, infrastructure, I want us to build pipelines, depots, terminals across the country. I'd like to get the natural gas and the oil from Texas, Permian, up to the Northeast. Because the Northeast pays more for heating and gasoline. Because they have to get it, they have to import it from overseas, which is Russia. Brent crude is more expensive. We can fix that if we run some pipelines up there. Okay? And they are safe. They are safe, and people know that. This has become an ideological political battle, not a factual battle. Um, that's too bad, because we really need to look at that to help the country grow. We need growth. Literally, we have the power of the country to grow. 
Uh, I'm particularly keen on that gas, but the others will play a major role. Pipelines. We need a lot of, we need west to east, and we need east to west. I mean, this Permian Basin itself, uh, if you separated it out as a country, would be producing roughly 7 million barrels of oil a day. And I don't even know what the number is for that gas. That would rank us very high just by itself. So we're going to have to pipe, let's pipeline this. Figure out a way to get to the West Coast, okay, maybe through Mexico, other, lots of ways to go about this, uh, maybe through Alaska, whatever, and then we export it to the Asian countries who are dying to get it. Every head of state, I mean, I, I, one of the neat parts about my job is I get to go to these bilateral meetings where foreign heads of state come and meet with President Trump over lunch or whatever. They all say the same thing. We need LNG. We need LNG. And my response is, you know, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, whatever, I will sell you as much as you can buy. So that's an aspect of infrastructure. And last point is we won't pay for it. The companies will pay for it. And not only will they build pipelines, they'll build schools and libraries to bolster the communities along the way. And not only that, it's a lot safer than using trucks, okay? Far safer than using trucks or rail cars, pipes. Safe. So that, that's an aspect of the infrastructure story uh, I'm very keen on, we're working on it, the president's very keen on it. Um, and it also has international strategic issues as well. So uh, just to pivot to the, the, the global scene, uh, it appears that um, there is this uh, correlation between foreign policy and economic leverage now. In, and I think in a way we haven't seen, at least overtly, um, in, in maybe many decades. Um, so if you look around the world, whether it's North Korea, China, the Middle East, uh, there always seems to be an economic lever. Well, how does that? How does your role play into that in advising the president? On well, look, these decisions are these decisions, security decisions, economic decisions, even military decisions are always integrated, intertwined. I, I don't think that's new. I think the front pages are, are new, yes, uh, because of uh, different issues around the world. Um, Reagan always said. Reagan always said that a weak economy at home leads to a weak position abroad, but a strong economy at home leads to a strong position overseas. And probably the Reagan thrust to overturn the Soviet Union, where we used many economic levers to hurt Soviets, who were enemies, many. We stopped them on many different fronts. And a lot of this stuff's being published now for the first time. Some of it's been out in some good books. So in many respects, President Trump has followed Reagan's idea. Now, I don't, people are talking about the Cold War with China. I'll leave that to the historian. But we have pretty big issues with China. I would rather tackle them with a healthy economy which we have, and they are tackling it with a weak economy. Okay, look at the numbers. Um, there are a lot of ways and means here. We also have a strong enough economy right now to finance a, build, a military buildup, right? So the Pentagon moved to 700 billion plus budget. Uh, that will slow down, but it is reminiscent, smaller. Reagan did the same thing. We started growing, we put lots of money, a couple trillion dollars in the Pentagon, which has been neglected for all those years. So that's somewhat similar today. And um, Secretary Mattis knows where it's been, and the National Security Council does too. So these things are intertwined. Again, the dictum, I've always believed this very strongly, the idea that strength at home leads to strength abroad. And we've been in a slump in the economy uh, for 20 years, in my judgment, under Republicans and Democrats. I think we have slump in world leadership. People say President Trump is withdrawing. I beg your pardon. Look what he's done. With respect to the Middle East, Iran, 
changing relationships with respect to NATO, with respect to North Korea, maybe China. I don't know. I don't want to write them off. As I said before, so far they've been uncooperative. Maintaining and strengthening Japan, bringing India closer. And we want to tackle the Latin American story, which is very difficult, but they want help. So, I mean, he's been quite active. Uh, sure. And we just recently, obviously, we got the pastor home from, from Turkey. So he is active. And we're going to use our strong economy, I think, to our best advantage. I think we're down to just a couple of minutes. Uh, in one minute, could you, we have some students here today. Advice for students? Mm. I've spoken at many commencements. I'll give you the same advice. Work hard. Work harder than you've ever worked before. And then when you get finished working harder than you've ever worked before, work even harder. That is the path to success. Really hard work. That is from my own experience. Um, most of my career, which is uh, whatever, four decades or so, I worked on Saturdays. In including recently, because I did a radio show on Saturdays. I worked on Saturdays. At the New York Fed, I worked on Saturdays. On Wall Street, I worked on Saturdays. In the government, hell, we worked, when I was an OMB, we worked Saturday and Sunday. Nuts, but we did. Um, it's a good thing, it's discipline. You learn, you accomplish, you achieve. You have to show up and work really hard. Don't complain. No complaints. I don't want to hear it. No whining. Just work your you-know-what's off. And then you'll do very well in life. And I will finally say this. Work is a virtue. Indeed, work is a godly virtue. So let us be virtuous. Well, Larry Cutler, it's very clear that you're working very hard for our country, and we appreciate you coming to Detroit. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And Larry Kudlow, from everybody in the crowd and from the Detroit Economic Club, a big high five to you for choosing Detroit for your remarks. Thank you so much. You could have gone anywhere in the country, but we appreciate you getting up early to come here. Thank you. Mark David, up outstanding jobs, presiding officer. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on time every time. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.